Hi, I am uh, Jennifer Foray. I am a professor of history at Purdue University, where I teach the AP European History Equivalent class, although in one semester. I also teach classes involving um, and studying modern European imperialism, decolonization, and the period of the Second World Wars. I'm sorry, two world wars. I also teach research methodologies for both undergraduate and graduate students. I've also served on the AP uh, European History Test Development Committee, working on the exam. Um, so helping to come up with the exam, both the regular exam and then the uh, kind of special COVID emergency exam last year. Served as a question leader at the reading, uh, mostly focusing on long essay questions and I help create the standards for us to assess your writing in these essays. In recent years, the LEQs that I've looked at have uh, mostly focused on the period of the 20th century, which is great because that's my field of research focus. My research focus actually incorporates a lot of the different threads and ideas that run through the 20th century. Those ideas and developments that taken together make up this unit eight, which is called 20th century global conflicts. In particular, I've focused on the persistence of certain political ideologies and practices over the course of the 20th century. So things like imperialism, fascism, communism, and in particular, how people act on these ideologies. I tend to focus a good deal on continuity and change over time. So for instance, I might look at how uh, different groups adapted original communist ideology to fit their particular circumstances. I investigate how and why European imperial policies changed over time and how these changes affected the relationship between European colonizers and the people that they colonized. Currently writing a book examining the decolonization of Indonesia, which happened after World War II. And this was prompted by Indonesian nationalists declaring their independence from the Netherlands. This happened in August of 1945, right after the Japanese surrendered. The Dutch government, however, refused to recognize this ultimately and declared war. In late 1949, after four years of conflict and negotiations, the Dutch government finally recognized Indonesian independence. My book is looking at those who oppose this war, mostly those Dutch men and women who worked for peace, who refused to fight in the conflict, who urged the Dutch government to negotiate and to give up the colony sooner rather than later. It also looks at the United Nations involvement since this was one of the first conflicts in which the very brand new United Nations and its Security Council became involved in the conflict. But my talk today is based on ideas that I explore in my first book, which focused on the German occupation of the Netherlands during World War II. Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940. And after the Dutch uh, surrender, Hitler handpicked a number of prominent German and Austrian Nazis to rule the occupied country for the next five years. The Netherlands, like so many other countries in Europe at this time, became part of the Nazis' new order or its new European empire. This Nazi new order, at least as it was planned, was to include uh, first Europe and then ultimately the world. That last part didn't come to pass because the war ended with the Allied victory, um, but this was part of the plan, at least according to, to some. In early 1942, so shortly after the events of Pearl Harbor in the United States, and less than two years after the Netherlands became part of the Nazi New Order, the Japanese invaded and then occupied the Netherlands colony in Asia, which was then known as the Dutch East Indies or today's Indonesia. So when I first, when I wrote my first book, I posed and tried to answer a simple question. Did Nazi Germany's occupation of the Netherlands make the Dutch rethink their own colonial rule over people, the Indonesians in particular, since that was their most important colony 
Or in other, in other words, did being occupied themselves make the Dutch into anti-imperialists? The short answer is yes, somewhat, but only to a limited extent. So this, the time that we have together, I wanna to focus our attention on one part of this larger subject of the research that I've conducted over the years and that I'm still conducting. And that is Nazi Germany's attempt to occupy and impose this new order throughout Europe. I'm going to use these slides to provide you with images that allow us to see how these ideas played out in practice. And as we, as we look at these images together, I'll draw attention to, and I'd like you to consider their sourcing. Who produced them and why? What did they hope others would do with these images when they were made public at the time? So first though, I want you to think about some of the themes you've seen in unit seven, uh, 19th century political perspectives and political development. So that's the units right before this, because what I'm going to talk about is building upon some of these ideas. And so in that unit, um, you'll become familiar with the idea of new or modern European imperialism. This renewed push to uh, settle, to colonize, to exploit territories in Asia and Africa. This period of modern imperialism wasn't only focused on acquiring new colonies, though. We tend to focus on, on the, the scramble for Africa, for instance, in Asia, but it's not simply about just a land grab. Rather, in the 19th century and 20th century, European powers such as Britain, France, and the Netherlands also sought, sought to expand and to consolidate their rule over areas where they had been for a significant period of time. So for instance, the Dutch had a presence in what they called the East Indies for centuries at this point, at this time of modern imperialism. But at the turn of the 20th century, they took over other islands. So not just the main islands, but the other islands around there and consolidated their rule over the colony. So now it becomes really the modern Dutch East Indies colony. Nazi expansion throughout Europe during the Second World War followed much of the same patterns to acquire this vast amount of territory, the pink and the red that you see on the map, the German army either invaded and defeated local army, armies in these other countries, or perhaps they were able to negotiate with local rulers in these countries who didn't want to see violence, who didn't want to see um, destruction of their, their territory and their land and their armies. So they negotiated with the Germans instead. In either case, you can see what the end result was. This is what it looked like in 1942. Um, this is the height of German control over Europe, the height of this Nazi new order in Europe. And this drive towards imperialist expansion was based on Nazi ideology concerning Lebensraum. That idea that, that Germany and the German people needed space to settle and to propagate German culture. So it's obviously an imperialist ideology, right? It looks to take new lands, but it also looks to settle racially pure Aryan peoples on this land where they would work this land and spread out and so on. These ideas concerning race and space would serve as the foundation for the Nazi new order. They're always working in tandem together. I will say, though, that scholars haven't always discussed the Nazi New Order as an imperialist project, and that this framing of Nazi imperialism is a relatively new addition to the way that we understand this period. When I tell my students this, they usually respond with surprise because it seems so straightforward and so obvious to them. Nazi Germany was trying to create its own empire, not in Asia or Africa, but in Europe. So why was, it, why was it so controversial to say this or to think this? Well, to answer this question, I want you to recall the context. When the Nazis embarked on this empire building project in the 1930s and 40s, the decolonization of European empires was far on the horizon. Some colonies would not become independent for decades to come at this point. The French, the British, the Dutch, the Belgian, 
they all had their own overseas colonies at the time of the Second World War. And for the most part, they wished to maintain those colonies. So to say that the Nazis were creating their own empire in Europe would have required politicians, journalists, military leaders, businessmen, everyday citizens to ask some uncomfortable questions. If the Nazis are acting like imperialists and we're imperialists, what does that make us? What are we doing in the colonies? Are we no better than Nazis? And at the time, very few people were willing to confront the implications of this kind of comparison. So they just pushed these questions aside. Until decades later, scholars revisited them with a very different set of eyes, with new materials, with knowledge of what happened in the years after World War II, when these European empires began to transform and disintegrate. I won't say the European empires went away entirely because there are still European held colonies around the world today. So now when we speak about Nazi imperialism in Europe, it carries far less of an emotional or moral charge. Um, although one we would hope today, people still do not want to be compared uh, to Nazis. So we return to the Nazi imperialist project of the 1930s and 1940s. And I wanna draw your attention to what I think is a particularly interesting image. Here you can see a Nazi propaganda poster boasting about German colonies in Africa. And even if you don't know German, you can probably make out some of these, these words. It's talking about the colonies of Cameroon, Togo, German East Africa, and German Southwest Africa. This photograph dates from 1937. So perhaps you're saying to yourself, wait, according to the Treaty of Versailles, which was signed in 1919, Germany lost these overseas colonies. They became mandate territories of the League of Nations. So the colony, so the Germans hadn't had these colonies for nearly 20 years at this point of this poster. And even the poster, right, says this is what they looked like in 1914. It's at the end of that top line. Why publicize something that doesn't exist anymore? All of this is true, of course. So as you look at this image, I want you to consider why and how these references to the once German colonies could serve Nazi goals. This is a really rich image, not for what it actually says, but for what it implies. And you can take your analysis in many different directions if you know the other developments of the 20th century. So seeing this image on the street in 1937, a German passing by might be prompted to think, look, Germany used to have all these large colonies. Look at this landmass. Look at these millions of people that were under German rule in the colonies. But Versailles took this away. Maybe we won't get these territories back, these particular ones, but we can get other ones. We've done it before and we'll do it again. Germany can be an empire again. It might have reminded everyday people on the street too, looking at these palm trees and, and the kind of landscape that doesn't exist in Germany, um, might have reminded them that a world existed outside of Nazi Germany that the world was theirs to explore, perhaps to take. So this poster isn't directly calling on the German people to help colonize Europe, of course, but it reminds them that Germany used to have colonies and that the other European powers had taken them away from them. That Versailles, once again, is to blame for Germany's fate, but Germany no longer had to suffer such indignities at the hands of other European powers. Perhaps a bigger piece of Europe then might serve as a valid replacement for these now long gone colonies. Shortly after a visiting photographer, American photographer by the name of Julian Bryan would take this picture in 1937, Hitler's government began to put these ideas into practice, as you know, in Austria, the Sudetenland area of Czechoslovakia, and then the rest of Czechoslovakia. In March of 1938, Nazi Germany took over Austria, the land of Hitler's birth in what was called the Anschluss or annexation, a kind of connection, not necessarily a seizure, something meant to be mutual almost. 
Before this point, Austrian Nazis had violently overthrown the legitimate government. And then once the Nazis were in charge of the government, they promptly invited Hitler and his military forces to take over the country, which he did. And this postcard celebrated Hitler's unification, as it's saying there, of Nazi Germany and Austria in March of 1938. As you can see in the text, it's reading one people, one empire, one Fuhrer. This is the first step in the creation of this new European empire. A very natural first step for those such as Hitler, other Nazis, but also everyday people um, who had argued that Austria and Germany belong together, that these territories were a natural fit for one another and that they should be together again, just as they had been together in the age of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire, in fact, figures very prominently in these ideas of the Nazi new order. After all, Hitler's government was called the Third Reich. And this implied the existence of a first and second, right? The first was the Holy Roman Empire, and the second was the unified German state created under Bismarck in 1871. So this reference to the Third Reich is quite intentional. And keep in mind, under the Second Reich, this is when we see Germany acquire these overseas territories, right, of Africa and Asia that we saw in the previous image, but have since been stripped away. As conceived by Hitler and Nazi party ideologues, those who came up with these ideas, the Third Reich built upon this rich imperial history, but also sought to expand upon it. The Third Reich would be larger, much more all-encompassing, a grand new empire under Hitler's control. So not just a restoration of what had been before, but a true expansion of it. It would include much of the European continent, as you can see in this undated German map, which indicates what countries would be part of this new order, regardless of, of whether the people living there wish to be part of it, of course. But this imperialist project of the Nazis was not simply about acquiring more land for Aryan people to settle. It sought to impose a new racial order throughout Europe. And so it remained deeply ideological. It's not simply about the land and the space itself. This map portrays Germany as the center of what they call here Nordic culture, this Aryan culture. Um, and it shows how this Nordic culture, again, according to the Nazi ideologues, members of the party and thinkers and so on, politicians who came up with these images, showed this Nordic culture as not only the center of civilization, you see it right there in the center of the map, but how it was disseminated throughout the region, how it had been brought to others. It also shows in yellow, for instance, the bottom, the other cultures that existed in Europe, North Africa, the Middle East. And you can imagine that someone may be viewing this map in 1938 in Germany, someone who's sympathetic to the Nazis ideas, might see the inclusion of those other cultures as, as an afterthought, that was kind of interesting, but not really essential. Because the central point of this map is clear. The Nordic race, the Nordic culture stands at the center of Europe, and again, perhaps the world, although that's not shown in this map. This is simply focusing on Europe. So during the course of 1940 and 1941, nearly all European countries and peoples from France and Norway to the westernmost territories of the Soviet Union would come under some form of German rule or find themselves allied to the German war machine. Once the Germans established control over an area, they administered it as a colony of sorts. All of these colonies of the Nazi New Order, conceptions of race and blood determined the treatment of conquered peoples. On the Nazi race scale, as you may know, the Slavs stood only above the Jews, both were subhumans or untermenschen. Yet while the Jews were slated for extermination, the Slavs were to become the slaves of the German Reich. They were to toil the land, they were to become the manual labor for the ethnically pure Aryans. So the Poles were subjected to an absolutely brutal occupation. Meanwhile, 
those people who were seen by the Nazis to be co-Aryan, this is a term that they used, the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Danes, were subjected to more lenient forms of government because of their preferential racial status. At the same time, the punishment of those who resisted Nazi rule was especially harsh in these countries because more was expected of them. So whereas the Poles were subjected to an absolutely brutal type of rule with a great deal of violence and destruction in the streets of life, of property, in the Netherlands, for instance, this doesn't really happen in the same way, at least not publicly. Um, those who resisted, those who protested may have been executed out of sight of the public or they were shipped off, shipped off to a camp, um, but they weren't necessarily killed in the streets. Sometimes the treatment of occupied populations hinged on other factors though, like economic necessity. So the desire to keep Czech factories running, for instance, meant that the Czechs, although Slavic peoples were considered, were considered and treated much better than the Poles. The treatment of occupied peoples throughout this Nazi new order was also dependent on the fanaticism and the personalities of the administrators appointed by Hitler to rule these territories because he put actual people on the ground in the Netherlands and elsewhere to be in charge of these, these new colonies. Some of these new administrators were more concerned with race than others. Um, some of them were uh, military leaders who were more concerned with winning the war and less concerned with the racial treatment of local populations. So um, behavior and treatment of civilians in these areas throughout the Nazi New Order varied tremendously. Beginning in 1943, however, this Nazi New Order began to fall apart and then ultimately break down. With the German defeat at Stalingrad, the tide had turned against the Germans on the Eastern Front. So that area that's in, in kind of pinkish rows here will be stopped and, and turned back. That will be the height of the Germans' advance on Eastern Europe. Meanwhile, at the same time, Allied forces, including the United States, prepared to land on European shores coming from the Northwest in France and from the South in Italy. At this point, the Third Reich was desperately in need of supplies and labor for the war effort. And so German rule of all of these countries became even more oppressive, but also more erratic. Mass reprisals against innocent civilians, taking of hostages, murder of these hostages, um, people were liable to be seized off the street for forced labor in Germany. Hundreds of thousands of Jews from Western Europe would be deported eastward to concentration and death camps. By this point in 43, millions of Jews from Eastern Europe were already dead. Perhaps not surprisingly then, starting in 1943, anti-Nazi resistance groups all throughout Europe gained momentum, popular support, funding, and official recognition from the Allies. So they were really considered part of the Allied war effort after 1943. These resistance groups had always existed in these areas that became part of the Nazi new order. But now that it seemed as if the Allies would win, others rushed to jump on the bandwagon as well. I want to end with a slightly different image of this Nazi new order, which was issued by Great Britain's ministry, wartime ministry of information, their kind of propaganda division during the war. We don't know exactly when the ministry issued this great image, but if I had to guess, it would be after 1942 or around 1942, when the Nazis had established control over much of Europe but had not yet been turned back at Stalingrad. Because if you look at those spider legs on the far right um, that are in the, the kind of east, Eastern Europe into Russia, the ones going into Russia haven't been broken yet. So this is why I think it's around 1942 or so. I suspect that this may have appeared as a poster or a large size color print presumably displayed in a public place where it would inspire British citizens and soldiers alike to continue their war effort against a powerful enemy now commanding a vast amount of land. Like this menacing spider, the poster suggests, 
Hitler's Third Reich may have extended its reach throughout Europe, but it also meant that the spider was vulnerable in many different areas. The Allies could therefore plan to attack from many different directions, and this is what they did. So one by one over the next few years, the spider's legs would be broken. In 1945, the Nazis' imperialist venture in Europe, the creation of this race-based Nazi order, came to an end. It left in its wake tremendous death and destruction that would shape European history and society for many years to come. So I want to thank you for attending this talk offered by AP Daily. It's been my great honor to do this for you and to talk about my work and about these subjects. I wish you all the best with the rest of your AP European history course, any other classes that you're taking. I wish you all the best with the exam um, in May. And importantly, I wish you all the best with your future studies of European history and other forms of history, hopefully. And uh, I wish you a very good uh, end of your academic year. Thank you.